as we think about new and pending state and maybe federal legislation, um, what are some of the emerging issues uh, that are most concerning to you? For example, in California, we're going to be um, interacting with a new regulatory agency. Um, what should companies be thinking about? And um, um, I would also invite others on the panel uh, uh, to inject their thoughts on that as well. Thank you. And hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. This is Christy Preuss from Deloitte. And great question, Rick. Um, there's a couple of things that come to mind, and, and then I'll, I'll stop talking and, and pass the ball around because I'm sure others have thoughts on this as well. Um, the first couple of things, you know, you mentioned the regulatory agencies. That's certainly one that we're keeping an eye on. I think another thing that comes to mind for me and some of my clients, I spent a lot of time serving folks in the life sciences and particularly healthcare spaces um, is scope of some of these laws and how uh, employee information is potentially going to kind of sneak back into scope and what that means for some of our clients and how they prepare for data sets that in the past they haven't maybe necessarily been focused on or preparing or treating in the same way that they've been treating some of their uh, more consumer facing data. Uh, and so that's something that certainly comes to mind. The other thing uh, you mentioned it as well is consent. Um, I, like I said, spend a lot of time in the life sciences and healthcare industry. And I probably, I, I'm not kidding, spend 80 to 85% of my time these days helping those clients think through consent management. And this is before some of these laws have truly gone into effect. Uh, and so as the consent regimes change and as the way that we think about opt-in versus opt-out kind of shifts, uh, our ability to manage consent holistically, uh, to have solutions in place that can facilitate that management of consent uh, and enable our business uh, stakeholders to leverage what we are gathering uh, and, and hopefully gathering in kind of a single source. So we have a consent master so that they can run their marketing and analytics and all the things that kind of help to drive our business forward while managing the consent that we need to uh, to be in compliance with, with these laws as, as those consent um, requirements are, are changing. So those are some of the things that we're keeping an eye out on. Yeah, you said consent a lot. That's an important part of that story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Robert, Melissa, thoughts from you? Melissa, you wanna go first? Sure, yeah, I would say that. I think a lot of my clients are really worried about the consistency piece or just the, the unpredictability or uncertainty. I mean, we went through the CCPA regulation drafting process. Now we're going through it with CPRA, but it's with a new entity, right? So we, we don't know what that's going to look like. There are also a lot more items in the CPRA for which regulations are supposed to be promulgated. So I imagine it's going to be a even much more complex and drawn out process. We've never been through it with Virginia or Colorado before in our privacy context. So we don't know what that's going to look like. And we also don't know what the enforcement is going to look like. So I think it's that, you know, unpredictability of all the different players in this space and, you know, that could potentially regulate different companies that is, is top of mind for a lot of entities. Yeah, Robert. Yeah, so uh, kind of tying back to what Christy was saying, she spends a lot of time in life sciences med device. Um, what many of us do not realize is those those companies are not HIPAA covered entities, which are excluded from CCPA, CPRA, Virginia, Colorado. Consequently, when we start looking at entities, the definition of what must be consented or not consented and what is exempted or not exempted is very complex. If you start looking at wellness companies, if you start looking at companies who are gathering health data, they aren't HIPAA covered entities, so they have to comply, whereas folks who are HIPAA covered entities don't have to comply. So now what we do is in many organizations, the benefits program is a covered entity that ties back to the employee statement. But on the other side, the commercial organization is not a covered entity and therefore not exempted. So we have the complexity of the laws themselves, and then we have the complexity of internal operations within the company. Lastly, on this vein is when GDPR first came out and even pre-GDPR for the, the directive, we used to take a most stringent standard approach. The problem is, is any framework that you develop from a requirements perspective uh, is only a slice in time. And that's going to change based upon the new laws that come out. So Colorado has more stringency or a different definition than Virginia, which has a more stringency or a different definition than California, but it's all based in California. So trying to keep track of your jurisdictions and the laws you must comply with becomes extraordinarily complex. And then that ties back to what Melissa and Christy both just said. Yeah, I, 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 good information from all of you. And complexity is certainly the key to that. 
Um, um, Melissa, as we think about the complexity um, and we think about meeting um, compliance obligations, uh, particularly across multiple states, um, as we're alluding to in this in, in your responses just now, um, some of this is complicated. Um, some of this is 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 gray in how we interpret it. Um, what advice are you giving clients uh, on you know how do you start? Where do where do you begin with all of this? And, and how do you start? And what, what what are the first steps you should do? Right. The key is for any companies that haven't done it yet, it, it's time now everyone has to do data mapping. There's just there's no way to avoid de- data mapping anymore. You, you have to know where you're getting data from, what data you're getting, how you're using it, and even more importantly, how you're sharing it. Because so many of these new laws have very specific requirements with regard to you know, the sharing of data between different entities. And the CPRA now, there are even obligations to pass deletion requests, not just to your service providers, but also even to third parties and contractors that you may have shared data with. So understanding you know, at a minimum um, what you're collecting, how you're using it, and how you're sharing it is, is super important. At the end of the day, though, all of these laws, globally even, beyond just the U.S., there are so many common themes, right? So when I first talk to a client that's completely overwhelmed and like, where do I start? I bring them back to the basic principles. Like so many of these laws have the common themes. Let's try to develop a privacy program that addresses those common themes and hits on all of them. And then we can use the data mapping exercise to figure out the unique compliance pieces that that you need to think about and some of the things that make your processing activities different or that might trip up some of these more complicated pieces. Um, But, you know, at the end of the day, privacy and security compliance, it's not a one-time exercise, exercise, right? It's iterative, it's dynamic, it's ongoing. (laughs) So a lot of companies need to think about, like, we need to start someplace, we can build on it. And then the key is to really determine what type of company you want to be. Do you want to take the granular approach where you really do try to tailor your compliance program to each law and use technology so you only apply certain rights to people with certain IP addresses from certain jurisdictions? Or do you want to take a common, most you know, lowest common denominator approach and apply the most stringent uh, protections just sort of across the board, right? One is sort of easier from a compliance perspective, but you might have some business impacts and vice versa. Yeah. Um, uh, Christy or Robert, anything you want to add to that? The other thing I would say is I think that it's becoming, uh, first of all, couldn't agree more with everything Melissa just said. Um, some of it, you took the words right in my mouth. I think that that's exactly right. Principles-based approach makes sense in a lot of cases and evaluating kind of what your risk uh, tolerance threshold is as a company is super important because it matters what you're trying to get to. What what play, What is good to you doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as what is good to your competitor or your peer. Uh, so couldn't agree more. Um, the thing I was going to say too is it's becoming more and more obvious that because there are going to need to be, um, you know, shifts in the way that the business operates for us from a privacy standpoint, that privacy awareness and uh, acumen across an organization is becoming more and more important. And it's more than just a once a year training or an onboarding training that they take when when they become a new employee and they never see it again and they click through a couple of slides and then they're done, right? Because they are our business counterparts, um, whether they're product leads or tech leads or or whomever, uh, marketing folks, they are the ones that are actually going to enable our privacy program to be successful over the long run. Because to Melissa's very, very valid point, it's not a point and shoot uh, one-time exercise, it's ongoing. And our teams within the business lines need to, from a cultural standpoint, kind of see it as a part of what they do if we want to make our program over the long run, all of those component parts that Melissa was mentioning, if we want to make those successful, it can't just be sitting within legal, sitting within compliance and hoping that with those kind of back office functions, we're crossing our fingers and getting it all done uh, by ourselves. It's it's just not going to work out that way with all of these new laws and all of them having these very, very operational components to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Robert, any last comments on this from you? Yeah, uh, uh, Christy, one of the things Christy was saying was really alluding, I think, to the concept of human capital change management and embedding privacy at the very foundation of the business. And then Melissa's talk used the words compliance and defensibility all in the same sentence. And there's a whole question now uh, when you come into organizational risk is, are we going to be defensible or are we going to be compliant? And what is the difference between the two? And one of the keys to that comes to embedding it at the foundational level of the business, and it's really part of everyone's job. Look, there's, I don't know how many people are on the call right now, uh, 
many of us are smart people. Many of us have been around privacy for many years. I've been in privacy since two, um, 2003. One of the things that this has done is this, these laws globally have legitimized privacy as a profession and it's no longer a sideline. So as companies approach all of these principles, as Christy said, it has to be embedded. You have to determine your risk profile. Melissa's talking about defensibility and compliance, but the reality is privacy as a profession is legitimized now. The question is how does senior leadership view privacy within the organization from a risk profile? Yeah, I think that's um, that's an, uh, an important uh, set of uh, things to think about. And, and thank you to, for the three of you for sharing those things. A couple of things that that I heard um, that um, th that I'd like to explore a little bit. You know, um, um, Christy, you you know you use the term "what's good for you." Robert, you were talking about defensible. Um, uh, I think Melissa, you were talking about uh, mapping to uh, the most stringent common denominator. Um, all of this gets really complicated. There are human capital costs. There are capex costs. There are uh, um, uh, uh, time uh, and effort and, and you know, all kinds of other costs that are associated with standing up a program like this. A lot of companies say to themselves, I shouldn't say a lot of companies, there are companies that say to themselves, heck, it's not worth it. I, I, I'd rather get caught or I'd rather pray that I don't get caught or get in trouble. Um, uh, I certainly am not advising anybody to take that position, uh, but talk a little bit, if you would, about what the costs are for not complying and, uh, and, and where you end up. And is that a risk you're willing to take? Uh, yeah. Robert, I'll start with you on that. Yeah. So um, for, first of all, those are, I, I've switched from the chief privacy officer being a decision maker to the chief privacy officer being a risk advisor. And the types of questions that you have just asked have got to be decided at the highest levels of the organizations because there is shareholder value, there's personal liability, there's uh, fiduciary responsibility, and that has to be at the board in the senior leadership position. But secondly is after GDPR, many of us expected to see this plethora of gargantuan fines come out. And while there have been many, uh, there hasn't been many near as many as many of us expected. So you're right, a lot of companies are willing to roll the dice, particularly if they're under the radar. And consequently, we're finding companies that are very large names who are very immature in terms of existing compliance, whether it be GDPR, CCPA, CPRA, whatever you wanna call it. The rules are changing and the risk-based approach becomes extraordinarily important. And as we begin to do that, then what you have to do is to take that from the position of leadership. And then you have to operate within those constraints. Look, uh, many of us are consultants, right? We'd like to see some of our clients do different things. And we are, ha we are bordered by the border of the engagement. And by being bordered with the border of the engagement, there are things we can and can't do. So with all of that said, my point there is the risk approach has to be from the highest levels of the organization. And then the next steps become how you're going to execute below that. Yeah. So that, that's the decision um, to or not to, but um, um, thoughts for those listening uh, from, from Melissa, from Christy about um, what the implications are um, if, if you choose not to, uh, to be compliant. Yes, I'll say there's definitely been a shift. Like, I feel like there are far fewer companies that are like, I'm just going to roll the dice with this one, right? I mean, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you were doing diligence on a deal. You're like the privacy or the tech lawyer or whatever group you were in at the time that wasn't really a defined practice. And you'd get called at 11 p.m. the night before a deal was closed and say, hey, can you just like check if they have a privacy policy and just, you know, write like a simple rep to add into this agreement and, you know, we'll be good. Now I'm seeing deals fall apart because of Target's lack of, you know, privacy and security practices. I also think with the GDPR, with all of the privacy information that's been in the press, with just more consumer awareness around these issues, I've noticed a, a big shift in clients really viewing privacy as not a compliance exercise, but as more of a business enabler and a way to really differentiate themselves from other companies. And, you know, in particular, for some of my clients that are service providers or processors, 
they, they kind of have to be compliant because they're going to lose their enterprise customers if they can't show that they're willing to sign, you know, the, the DPA or the, the CPA, CCPA addendum. And you're seeing more and more processors have whole web pages on their sites dedicated to their global privacy compliance and trying to differentiate themselves. And, you know, if you get it wrong, the, the impact can be big. Like if you're a small company and you really misuse data, I mean, look at some of the apps that are collecting more sensitive health data where event data was being sent to Facebook and you have, you know, really sensitive information being used for advertising and huge public backlash. That's a real harm. And then on top of it, I mean, only the CCPA so far has a private right of action um, in comparison to the other state laws, but that private right of action is huge. If you have a data breach, you can now have you know, huge class action in California and plaintiff's lawyers are creative, right? They've been using that private right of action to um, you know, go beyond just the data breach component, component of the CCPA. And while maybe those suits won't ultimately be successful, it's still a huge reputational um, risk to companies and a huge compliance burden to have to go through even the beginning stages of a litigation. Yeah, that's a great point. Chris, any last thought from you on that? Uh, I'm just gonna pick up on the thread that Melissa um, started related to privacy as an enabler. Part of, I was mentioning before, I was joking that I spend 80 to 85% of my time right now uh, talking about consent. A lot of that is consent as an enabling capability to drive marketing automation, portal creation, um, you know, customer 360 views, give them a single view of their whole ecosystem and all of their choices and preferences and consents and all of that. I think that's really where the market is driving, even in some of the industries that historically have kind of lagged behind uh, privacy being somewhat of a marketing ploy or, or kind of a go-to-market pitch. Um, so there's always been that, that kind of feel in, in tech and Apple always, has always kind of used privacy as, you know, we're better than, than the Android, you know, choose us kind of thing that they've used it a little bit as a marketing ploy. Even in industries where that hasn't historically been the case, there's still this need to drive forward with more first party data, use privacy and consent and, and other capabilities like that as enabling functions. And so I think that that push too means that if you don't take this seriously and have kind of your back end house in order, you're actually missing out on some of the, the kind of future uh, work that your, your marketing teams, your, um, your analysts, all those, those groups are going to be pushing for you to have. Yeah, I, you know, I, I asked the question about non-compliance, and I and I think one of the things that came out of this is that 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 group of companies that are thinking I sh I don't need to or, or, or I'll, I'll roll the dice. Um, compliance is table stakes in today's era. It's table stakes for a controller to be able to collect the debt data uh, from their from their customer, right? Uh, the, to be able to offer a a reasonable value proposition to them that uh, the data that they're, that they're collecting is. It's being protected and, and is being used uh, the way that they say it's being used and that it's being shared only in the way that people have agreed to. Um, and it's um, it's table stakes for the importers, for uh, the data processors to be able to say, I'm worthy of being able to accommodate the business that you're hiring my company to do. So um, uh, um, yeah, hopefully the focus group of companies that are choosing not to comply um, are, are uh, is getting smaller and smaller. and, and um, 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 uh, I think that's probably a, a fair point. Um, I, I know this may seem, I, yeah, go ahead, Robert. I just wanted to add one thing, and I, this ties back to both what Melissa and Christy said. What I see emerging and what we're beginning to see emerging out of our clients these days is much more the concept of data governance versus just data privacy execution. As data flows back and forth across the enterprise, then you know, identification, re-identification, consent management, primary use, secondary use, inadvertent re-identification, all of those other types of things feed right back down into the business enablement. And if you aren't familiar with like the Poneman Institute studies on how consumers will switch if there's a breach, what we are seeing is an avoidance of companies just signing on the dotted line for these agreements that Melissa outlined a while ago and are taking a much more rigid approach because now they are beginning to not, one, see it as a business enabler if they are compliant, but two, know it will shut them down out of business if they don't have that formalization. So everything that Christy and Melissa have said really ties back to this, I think, the, an emerging concept of data governance that we've never seen in privacy before. Yeah, I, I think that's a really excellent point that you raised. You know, I think for a long time, there was this Venn diagram where there was a big overlap between privacy and security. 
And I think now that's morphed into this privacy and governance conversation that you just raised. And, yeah, um, it really goes back to the point, Melissa, you made at the top of the call, which was kind of, you, you called it data mapping, but just having better enterprise data management where privacy is almost a business we, we should, in the ideal model, push business requirements to our enterprise data management group so that they help us to manage the personal information the way that they manage any other uh, corporate sensitive information or any other you know, information that uh, producers or consumers are, are creating or using. And that way, privacy doesn't necessarily kind of get stuck or the legal team or the compliance group don't necessarily get stuck trying to you know, work through how specifically do we, do we have to handle personal information? It becomes part of the broader, you know, Robert called it data governance, enterprise data management uh, construct. And uh, privacy is, is kind of a, a happy consumer of that, of that cycle. And just one other small anecdote on this. I think it's really interesting that over the past year, I've had more than a dozen nonprofit clients come to me and say, you know, I'm not subject to GDPR. I don't have any operations in the EU, but I'm a U.S. company. And even though I'm not subject to CCPA, I want to at least have a CCPA compliance program or start to do something better with data because my donations are depending on it. Our constituents are asking some of our, you know, big institutional funders want to know what our privacy compliance is. So, you know, I really do think that there has been quite a shift over the recent years. Yeah. You know, a longtime mantra of mine and a phrase that I've heard in a couple of the sessions over today and yesterday was uh, using privacy as a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's really uh, again in, in in line with where this conversation has been going. Uh, something that's become uh, paramount and at the forefront of a lot of companies. Um, as we think about um, uh, you, you know the way that this is more for the data governance side, um, most of the new laws talk about um, uh, transparency and accountability. Um, and uh, and and I, and I think that's great um, that those things are be are becoming more and more important. As we think about the accountability side, um, um, and um, uh, Christy, I guess I'll start with you with, from a consulting hat point of view. Um, you know, what does accountability mean um, uh, beyond just uh, having to do privacy impact assessments? Sure. Yeah. So a lot of our clients um, are, if they if they had to comply with GDPR, they're they're probably a little further along in their journey here are creating pretty robust governance structures wherein privacy has a seat at the table or maybe is the chair of a particular kind of committee and, and so therefore kind of owns the table. Um, but having different stakeholders join either a privacy specific governing body or something that is, you know, maybe privacy security compliance, something like that, where privacy is, um, you know, a critical component and very importantly, I think where uh, critical business functions also have a seat at that table. So even if it's a, a committee that is shared across privacy and security compliance, they also have, you know, the commercial functions are included or the marketing functions are included or some of those uh, other business groups because, and it, this all kind of ticks and ties with some of the other themes we've mentioning, we've been mentioning before, you know, not just awareness and accountability across the business of, of what is coming what needs to be done uh, and who owns it, because it shouldn't always just be those back office functions with the responsibility for executing some of this work, of course, um, but also so that those business functions understand the risk of what happens and can make uh, informed decisions if, for instance, we you know, help a, a client implement something like a, a PIA privacy impact assessment or data protection, protection impact assessment process. And there's a risk that needs to be absorbed. They maybe don't, they don't want to shift gears and, and change uh, the work that they were doing because of the privacy risk. At least now some of the critical stakeholders and some of the higher ups within that organization can see the bigger picture, are looking at the forest and all of those risks that might be involved. And so can then kind of help uh, frame up where risk-based decisioning can occur within the organization from that more informed positioning. Yeah. Uh, Melissa, how about from the... Uh from the legal corner, uh, how, how are you thinking about accountability and what advice are you giving to clients? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, it's interesting, right? Because when we think about the distinction between the GDPR and US privacy laws, like the GDPR is a 
comprehensive, you know, overarching privacy law that does have a lot of built in documentation requirements and you know, needs for privacy impact assessments and things like that. And, you know, the CCPA didn't quite have as much of that. But at the end of the day, the companies who were doing a good job complying with the CCPA were having to essentially build in those accountability mechanisms because it's the only way to sort of ensure continued compliance. And now with the CPRA amendments and some of the provisions in the Virginia law and the Colorado law, there will be more sort of built in requirements from the beginning to to take on some of these accountability measures as well. So I've definitely, um, you know, I agree with everything that Christy said there. Yeah, Robert, slightly different version of this question, um, uh, where uh, PIA's uh, DPAAs are going to be a key component of many of the new state laws, um, much like uh, the analogy I can think of, and I, I can't remember the name of the application, but when you apply to colleges, you apply to many colleges with one application. Can you do one data pack? Can you do one privacy impact assessment and give it to every state, or or how are people going to be required to play that game? Uh, there, I think the opinions of lawyers in the room and non-lawyers in the room. No, <laughs> I mean, I think I think about um, at one point in time, I was the chair, vice chair of the, um, uh, the of the pharmaceutical privacy consortium. And as we're talking about there, all of, all of us, I was CPO of, of a pharmaceutical company in the US, and all, all of us were trying to figure out how not to do 27,000 vendor assessments that kept coming our way, or not having to send out 27,000. So there was a question of whether you could do one to many or many to one. And the reality is it never, it never took effect because everybody wants something different. And you know we're beginning to see industry standards emerge. We're beginning to see this, and the, and so I think there is a hope for standardization in many different areas. But even the laws themselves aren't standardized. I mean, there's there's an article on here, and Melissa, you're one of the co-authors, and you're talking about one of the differences between Colorado and the others, and that's the inclusion of nonprofits versus the exclusion of nonprofits, right? So the reality is, and this comes back to what Christy talked about, I think at the very beginning about employees, is everybody's gonna be included at some way, shape or form at some point in time, so you might as well just do it. And, and you need to do it in such a way that you can preempt what others are going to ask for. And if you can preempt what others are going to ask for, you're going to minimize the churn on your part, but you're never going to get rid of it. So I don't know if we'll ever have the, the equivalent of the student aid form that everyone fills out. But my hope is, you know, that between things like SOX and NIST and, you know, other emergence um, industry standards or other emerging standards, even coming out of Europe or California, that we would be able to minimize the impact on organizations. Yep. Thanks. Um, um, uh, either of the other two panelists, any thoughts on, on, on uh, adding to what Robert just said? Yeah, I would say a little bit of this goes back to the risk-based approach and finding a right-sized solution. And Melissa made the point earlier, there's, there's going to be organizations that uh, really do cater state to state. I have found that most of my clients are falling somewhere more in the middle, and they are looking to find uh, consistencies across their processes as much as they can, just like they're looking to plug those processes into existing processes within the organization as much as they can, because all of this, again, uh, is very reliant upon others to execute for us, right? The privacy office by itself does not complete the DPIA or the PIA process. It's the business stakeholders. And we've got to make it as streamlined and easy for them as possible while mitigating as much risk as possible. And having 27 different versions of a very, very, very similar questionnaire may or may not be the right solution for your organization. Most of my clients are trying to find ways to streamline so that their business folks are answering the questions with as much specificity as they can without confusing the business um, by having different variants of you know, something quite similar. Uh, but, it, but it does kind of fall back to that, that risk-based approach. It's, it's you know, what is your risk tolerance and what is, what is the right size for your organization? Thank you. Melissa, any thoughts from you? No, yeah, I agree. I, th I think we've gotten through this one. Um, 
in, in all of the new laws, um, uh, there is now you know accountability and oversight for your processors and your subprocessors and downstream accountability. Um, um, this can get rather complicated in terms of you know beyond having contracts. What are the how should you be managing your downstream vendors? And in your contracts, do you cut and paste the new SEC language and make them sign it? Is that what you do now? Is there a, is there a standard form you should be using? What are sort of the, the key data elements, that are at least the, the key talking points that, that that paper should have inside of it? Uh, uh, Melissa, I'll start with you because you're in the bottom. Part. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So there are definitely standard forms that you can start with, but you're inevitably going to have sort of the battle of the paper, right? And, and who's, whose paper is going to control because everybody has their standard form that they, they like the best. And, you know, I think that it's getting a lot harder now to just use a standard form and impose contractual obligations on a vendor and say, okay, that's it, we're done without any sort of diligence. I mean, if you're dealing with an EU transfer now, post trams you do have an obligation, and under the new standard clauses, you do have an obligation to do some sort of transfer assessment that's more than just sticking provisions in an agreement. You have to you know, think about whether the vendor is likely to be subject to certain types of orders or what they could potentially do to fight those orders, impose you know, some like, uh, encryption and other types of standards on those vendors. Um, and so there, there's a lot more that goes into it now. And even if we're not talking about transfers involving EU and we're just thinking from a US perspective, Given how complex some of the definitions of sale and sharing and sensitive data use are under some of these different state laws, um, you know, your, your vendors might not really know what those mean and they might sign something. But at the end of the day, if they are still engaging in activity that could be considered sale or sharing of data, you know, you as the business who provided the data could potentially be held liable for that. So, you know, I do think I have seen more of a, it's not just a contractual exercise, but there are some diligence questions that tend and diligence exercise that tend to go along with the vendor risk process. Also from a security perspective, right? Like assessing a vendor security practices is becoming more and more important and becoming a more common theme that I see in these contract negotiations. Yeah, I think this concept of doing a, a TIA, whether it's required or not, is probably a, a really sound practice. Um, 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 uh, Melissa, I'll, I'll, I'll bounce that question up to you next for any thoughts you have to, thoughts to add to that. Sure. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would piggyback off of what you just said about about having it be kind of a sound practice where it's required or not. A lot of our clients take um, I'm going to harp. I'm going to go back to something I, I basically just said. Take. Uh, a little bit of, of the same, if you were to think of a, a PIA process or a data protection impact assessment process, it's not fundamentally different when you're talking about vendors. I mean, you may be asking different questions and you're, you're trying to pick up um, that process from within your existing you know, security third-party risk assessment process. And so you're, you're piggybacking some of your privacy-related questions into securities uh, existing uh, uh, process but the ideas are still quite similar, right? You may or may not want to confuse the vendor with an incredibly wieldy and long privacy risk uh, series of questions if they're processing really, really low risk data for you, right? So, so the concepts are still very much the same. You may wanna have some sort of thresholding process to evaluate, you know, where do we really care? Where do we really wanna push this more detailed set of questions on them? Where are we only capturing, you know, business contact details? And so therefore the risk for us is low enough that we don't have to go down that path. Uh, and so the question sets in and of themselves might be slightly different between a, you know, a transfer impact assessment versus a, a you know, more standard privacy impact assessment, but the constructs around how you can set up those processes, you know, they tend to, to kind of mirror each other in, in some form. One thing I would just like to say on that, though, if you had ever asked me what the first, you know, sort of enforcement action related to Shrems would be, I would have never, ever guessed that it would have been related to MailChimp, right? That the <laughs> Varian DPA would have had an issue with companies sharing contact yeah. details for marketing purposes, right? Yeah. And again, that was yeah. that was just a failure of, of the EU exporter to not even do any diligence or impose any additional safeguards on MailChimp, but still it's, it's yeah. hard, right? It's, and I agree, like it has to be a risk-based approach, but that one really caught me off guard. <laughs> yeah. I think we all would have taken the under on that. Bet. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, Robert, anything to add to this uh, particular thought? Yeah. As, as we begin to look at third parties and the third party risk management process in this regard, um, many of these used to be a one and done, right? And we're, we're seeing those, those 
or term of life types of contracts, I'm, I'm beginning to see fewer of those. And the second thing is, is those that are engaging processors and we're beginning to see the word processor in the U United States where we didn't used to see that are what I do and taking a much more assertive and inv invasive testing approach and are beginning to audit more frequently that just what the initial survey was, wasn't the only survey that was done. And lastly is I'm beginning to see contract terms, not beginning, I am seeing contract terms that contractually establish who owns the data and who can do what with the data on whose direction. Uh, this is becoming more and more common. And if I look back to when I executed contracts, I did that in you know, 2008, 2009. But I think that that's something because of the risk and the liability that we're beginning to see more and more of is the, the very discerning and specific contract language as to ownership and then the right to audit on demand or otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly uh, the industry has shifted towards this uh, downstream obligation. Uh, it may seem a bit onerous right now for us to comply. I think we're all going to get used to it and learn how to do this better. Um, but um, but it, it's an, I think it's an important step that's being introduced into, into the process here. Um, let's switch gears just a little bit. I know um, there's been lots of conversation uh, uh, in laws that have failed and laws that um, are still uh, in session and laws that uh, we're talking about today, but um, you know, selling, sharing, not selling, not sharing, what does it all mean? Um, and how are we thinking about uh, complying with that, uh, at least now through three states? And uh, Robert, we left off with you. I'll start with you on this question. Well, what is selling, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's- Can we get Alistair back here? Yeah, today? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and again, referencing Melissa's article that I just saw, it really specifically calls out a difference between Colorado and Virginia and California, right? The definitions are changing, not only for nonprofit inclusion, but for the definition of selling. Um, and that's why I said earlier that um, the awareness of laws and the nuances of laws and taking a most stringent standard isn't always possible and that you have to become defensible, but you will never probably become compliant in that regard. So as, as we begin to go down those roads, then all of that changes because the risk model changes. Yeah. That risk model, again, comes back to what is the likelihood and what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Um, Melissa, thoughts from you since you authored uh, the, the paper that's come up a couple of times. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think I think this is really tricky. Right. I mean, under California, the definition of sale is very broad. It was the exchange of PI for any consideration, whether monetary or not. Right. Which is where I think a lot of companies viewed the sale definition as applying to some of their behavioral advertising and tracking type activities. However, now under the CPRA, we have this additional opt out right that's actually lumped together with the sale opt out right, but it's for sharing of data for cross context behavioral advertising purposes. So it really begs the question in California of what the difference between the two is. Was sale really meant to just cover, you know, the more um, like really exchange of lists for money, not based on what I've seen with the California AG's enforcement actions against some of our clients or, it, or inquiry letters, like asking about some of their practices that are more in the ad tech space. So no. So, you know, what is the distinction? And then in some of the other laws, it, it, you know, Nevada was very clearly tied to monetary consideration going back and forth and, um, you know, Virginia as well. And so I think it's just going to be really tricky to navigate all of these. And on top of it, you have some of the laws that are also requiring opt-in consent right. for the use of sensitive information, or under the CPRA, you have an opt-out for the use of sensitive information that in one part of the statute says, if the use of the sensitive information is for any purposes other than the providing the product, but then there's another provision further down, if you read in the weeds, that suggests there's an exception to that opt-out right if the sensitive data is not being used to build up inferences about people, which actually significantly narrows that opt-out right. So navigating these, and, and then on top of it, you have a bunch of regulations, right, that are kind of that are going to come out to further flesh these out. So I think this is still very much a moving target. I think it's tricky. I think you know companies are really going to have to pay attention to how this all um, ends up, you know, playing out through the regulatory process and just 
going to have to read really carefully and take that risk-based approach and determine where you're drawing the lines in terms of your practices and what you consider sharing or selling or using sensitive PI. Yeah, thank yeah you. and the other thing I was going to say too is, um, you know, Robert mentioned, for instance, like the, the um, Pharma Privacy Consortium. I, a lot of my clients play a wait and see game uh, when it, when it comes to how they define sale and they look at what their peers and counterparts are doing and they wait and they wait and they wait for somebody to make the first move. Uh, and they have conversations internally amongst, um, their peer CPOs and, and counterparts within, um, the, the privacy space, because I think this is one of those where given all of the complexities that Melissa just outlined, there's really not a ton of benefit to being the leader of the pack in, in making the first call um, from kind of an operational standpoint and being the first one to put something on your site or to you know, offer a particular uh, right to an individual. Um, and so uh, you know, practically speaking, what I'm seeing a lot of my clients do is, is kind of hang back a little bit and, and have conversations internally and, and amongst their peers and, uh, and kind of see where the space moves. Yeah. Um, another uh, another subject that um, uh, I guess we should talk about is uh, the concept of private right of action. It seems to be the dividing line on bills that are passing and not passing. Um, uh, you know, there there are uh, the extreme sides of opinions about whether PRA is good or bad, um, and um, and yet uh, it is it is here for a little bit in California. Um, it doesn't appear to be here in the other two state laws that are passed, but um, um, how, what should people be thinking about in terms of uh, private right of action and class action suits? And, and uh, I know it's an obvious question, but what should they be doing to prevent that? Um, uh, uh, um, Melissa, we'll start with you. Right. Well, I mean, again, as I mentioned, the, the plaintiff's lawyers are becoming more creative. And now with the under the CPRA, so before the private right of action under the CC, CCPA, the existing law, was limited to a breach of only certain types of personal data as defined in California's breach law. Under the CPRA, that's actually going to expand to include all of the data components in the existing California breach law, which includes a mere breach of username and passwords, which all of a sudden will potentially bring even credential stuffing attacks that aren't really the fault of the company where the breach is occurring into the scope of what plaintiff's lawyers might be trying to bring. And that's all of a sudden, I think, a lot more potential class actions. In terms of what to do to avoid it, well, you know, for a while it was, oh, arbitration, let's put an arbitration clause in our terms of service. Um, it'll defeat the privacy claims. Um, will require you know, no class action ARBs and all of that. But even over the last year, we've seen that become more complex as plaintiff's lawyers have gotten creative in that field and have come up with mass arbitration filings. And so now you have all the lawyers trying to come up with creative ways to draft the arbitration clauses to make them enforceable, have the consumer protections that you need in them, but also try to defeat the mass arbitrations. And so it really is a very complex puzzle um, that you have to put together to try to come up with ways to so-called defeat these types of class actions. Complex puzzle. I like that. <laughs> I'll quote you on that. Uh, 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 Barbara Christie, thoughts on, on this subject? Uh, from my perspective, you know, we just had the initial meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency. And they're going to, I think the, the quote, if I recall, it was in the IAPP says so they're going to start from the ground up. Yeah. And st Starting from the ground up, what that means is we don't know what the future is going to bring from a rulemaking perspective. Uh, they have a whole subcommittee that's set up just to establish priorities. And as they move forward, I think we're going to see a level of complexity and this uh, that we've never seen before. And I think it's also going to become much more didactic, meaning, meaning much more specific. So as an example, you know, HIPAA has specific security clauses that you and standards that you have to comply with. GDPR and CCPA basically says thou shalt comply with you know, a security standard that is appropriate to the sensitivity of the data that you're processing. I think that as we move forward, the opportunity, coming back to what Melissa says, the opportunity to be caught up in a legal situation is, is much more intense than it ever has been in the past, but we won't know what that is for a period of time and it can change from day to day. Yeah. Christy, I know that your clients freak out about this because I'm the same industry clients that do. Yeah, yeah but I, I would agree with the points made. I, you know, I think that um, 
it's because currently it's it's an issue that we haven't seen um, promulgated across the the additional states, right? It's it's kind of still a California issue. To be honest with you, most of my clients recently haven't been um, they haven't been as concerned uh, about this, and it hasn't been something that's been coming up a ton in conversations because from an operational standpoint, recently there hasn't been a lot of change that would, would that would drive, um, you know, uh, updates to the way that they're handling it because, because the, the change hasn't happened since, um, you know, the, the private right of action from CCPA. Yeah. So regulate, sorry, from a regulatory enforcement action. And it, there are a number of clients that are like, Oh, well, there's a 30 day cure period, or there's a six day cure period in the statute. The question though, is how the attorney generals or the, you know, it, it, the enforcement um, agency is going to look at that and whether they think something is in fact curable. If you right. sold someone's data, you can't pull that back. Right. So it, it's, it's a little bit of a, like, Oh, yeah. we have some protection there. There's a cure period, but it, it's not, you know, a full protection. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, I think people think about this in that I don't have to worry. I'm a little company. They're going to go after the big companies with deep pockets first. Um, you know, the other argument to that is, is that, um, um, you know, that they're just going to find examples uh, where people are doing the wrong thing, i.e. a mail chip, chimp uh, situation, um, so that so the precedent can be established and that, um, uh, uh, you know, that's the, sort of the Lego board for, uh, for going after the, you know, the elephants that they'll inevitably be hunting. Um, big companies, little companies need to be concerned. Am I correct? Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone's immune. I mean, I do think that yeah. bigger players are going to have the biggest targets on their back, but that doesn't, you know, just take some complaints. If a little company with a small app is collecting really sensitive data and doing creepy things with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a very interesting statement, uh, doing creepy things with it, because uh, we also have a balance from the, the environment of California, and that's the California economy itself, right? So um, I think that there's going to be a proportionality of response. But then I think they are also, you know, if we go back to the Cambridge days, those things are not going to be permitted at all. So I'm, I'm very interested to see the proportionality of response, particularly once the California Privacy Protection Agency, you know, staffs itself up and becomes responsible for enforcement and assumes that role from the AG. Yeah. We are uh, coming up at the top of the hour here. Um, uh, Time flies when we're speaking uh, with such interesting people. So um, thank you. Um, I will ask uh, sort of our, 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 uh, my, Justin's favorite question to ask on spokes, um, federal legislation. Are we, you know, with can spam, I, I mentioned that at the opening of, uh, of, of the session, you know, one of the things that, uh, that drove can spam to happen, and ironically, California was the last straw, was that we had 20 something, 30 something individual state, state spam laws. Uh, and then California came down with the big hammer and everybody said, time out, we can't do this. And we passed a federal law pretty quick. Um, you know, uh, we, we won't go into the politics of over the last two or three administrations why we did or didn't have privacy laws. Uh, but now with growing pressure around the world, uh, with the myriad of state privacy laws that, you know, seem to be coming up and may complicate things, uh, 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 despite uh, what Mr. McTaggart says about he doesn't think this will be complicated to comply with lots of state laws, um, it will be complicated. It may not be as complicated as other people are making it seem, but it's going to be complicated. Um, are, are we going to see federal privacy legislation? In the next, and, and, and if so, uh, when's it going to happen? Uh, round robin on this, anybody who wants to go first. So I'm the biggest pessimist on this. So you, I mean, you have a great point about can spam. However, what I always say when I'm asked this question is that we never thought we would have 50 different state data breach laws, and we have 54 now, right? Yeah. So, and that's only trying to, those are only trying to solve for one harm or one particular type of situation or when you're reporting a data breach. When you're talking about federal privacy legislation, will there be preemption? Will there be a private right of action? Who's going to enforce? Is it going to focus on use, sharing, collect? Like there's just, there's so many components that I just think make it really difficult. So I personally don't see it happening anytime soon, or if it does, it's going to be a baseline piece of legislation without much teeth that the state laws are still going to live on top of. Yeah. I actually sit 
yeah, very ahead. solidly in Melissa's camp. That's that's the way I feel about it too. I I wish I could say I was more hopeful than I am um, for a number of the reasons Melissa just listed. I think it's highly unlikely that we're able to get something across um, both both aisles, both houses, um, or both parts of of Congress that has any real, use the word teeth, I think, has any real teeth to it and is anything uh, above kind of a, a watered down version of, of what they they started with. I, I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon. Yeah, Robert. If you look at the testimony that's occurred towards federal law today, many of them are, you have industry wanting preemption and you have states not wanting preemption. And you know, HIPAA, that's a big one. It establishes a floor and not a ceiling, meaning that states are free to implement more stringent laws if they choose to do so. So you look at Texas Health and Safety Code 181, the California Confidentiality and Medical Information Act, many of them have components more stringent than HIPAA. So uh, believe it or not, I agree with both Christy and Melissa. I give this a 25% chance if I had to quantify it maybe a 20%, and I don't care who's in office, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, I think the likelihood is very low. It's very low. Uh, and so the, interesting, I, I'm a little bit more optimistic. I think there's a lot more pressure. Um, if they can tackle private right of action, if they can tackle preemption, um, those are two big things, uh, but um, those are what are killing individual state laws right now, right? So it'd um, uh, be interesting to see. Similar but different question. Uh, Safe Harbor 3.0, Privacy Shield 2.0. Are we going to see one? Uh, does it happen in 21? Um, what, what do we think about that? And uh, I'm sure Justin will be asking Bruno those same questions as we wrap up this afternoon. I tell people to stay the hell away from it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, look, I, I go, 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 you know, go, go, model contract clauses, standard contract clauses with the consult of the authorities, uh, or you know, go the global route. Just, I just don't think it's a safety net at all, yeah. no matter what the hell they say. And I'm sorry about the language, but it's a pretty strong felt feeling. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, 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 either of the two of you, anything to finally add to that? I was going to say now that we have the roadmap from the EDPB and from the standard contractual clauses of what the additional safeguards would need to look like and what the additional like kind of transfer risk assessment process would look like, it's possible to have a privacy shield 3.0 that would incorporate those same principles. But again, with the precedent of being struck down twice, like I agree, like it's, it's, yeah. it's really, like just do the standard clauses, right? Or, I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know Justin's very close to Privacy Shield, so I'm, I'm sure he's hoping that um, we'll see a new one. But <laughs> in any event, um, I, I just want to thank you so much for being a part of this, this uh, discussion. We're at the top of the hour and we've run out of time. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. Um, regardless of how we are all thinking about this, it's good to know that people who work at companies like yours are there to help uh, the world uh, 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 make sense out of it all. And certainly a uh, shameless plug for us, Wirewheel and companies like us are here to provide the technology uh, to enable the things that you're going to tell people they need to do. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you for the advice you've given to people uh, in this session. Uh, and with that, I will, uh, I will pass it back to Chris to wrap us up.